Good to see everybody here today, and great to be here. We're um, going to continue in our study of the resurrection evidence for it. Um, but before we get into that, let's uh, go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are again mindful of your presence in our lives and everything you have done for us, continue to do for us, and the promise you have made. We know that uh, you, your word is true, and you have left it for us to know you, to know what you'd have us to do. And we pray, Father, in our continued study that would help us to increase our faith and also increase our knowledge, that we might be able to help to uh, tell others about the uh, salvation found through your son Jesus and the evidence that uh, would provide that. Father, in all things, we are mindful that uh, you are the one that we want to glorify, and may it be you that we strive to please at all times. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. So last week we started in and started talking about the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. And actually we were kind of looking at, you know, what other people, how people have tried to explain that away. And we looked at, um, we started out by just talking about the importance of the resurrection, why we even study this, right? Because it is central to the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, it's like we're no better off than anybody else. So it's very, very important that we understand this. And we recognized also that Talking about the resurrection is different than the other religions out there. I mean, that's one of the things that makes Christianity unique, okay? Um, and we talked about some of the basic facts, primarily from the gospel accounts we've been looking at, that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. We have historical references of that. He was buried in a known tomb. This is important. Uh, and a tomb was found empty three days later, and disciples claimed that Jesus rose from the dead. And this is the fact that people want to try and dispute. Because uh, if we can get rid of the resurrection, we can get rid of Christianity and even God. So uh, we started looking at how people, we looked at a couple of these facts very quickly, so I won't go over them again. Um, we got down to talking about these here, okay? And we just got started uh, in the set of different ways people have explained it last week. We actually started looking at this, that Jesus did not actually die, the swoon theory, right? And we looked at the fact that this is actually a relatively new uh, proposal, that this is only a couple hundred years ago that somebody proposed that this was the case. Um, and we looked at some of the facts that, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense that he didn't die. The Romans knew how to make sure somebody was dead. They, you know, the hanging on the cross, everything he went through, the people who buried him would have made sure they were dead. They didn't want to bury a live person. Um, so it's you know, hard to imagine that he would have been alive for three days in that tomb. Okay? Um, and it was something else as I was doing some more studying on it this week. Um, you know, he's, he was beaten to the near the point of death to begin with, right? Didn't have any food or water for more than two days, for three days even. Um, he was crucified, right? Um, pierced with the sword. Um, when they pierced his side, outflowed blood and water. It wasn't just blood. I mean, this is just, you know, somebody is dead. Um, and then something else, I don't have it up here, but something else that occurred to me too when I was studying this is when they went to wrap him and embalm him, they wrap him in myrrh, which is a sticky substance. They would have covered his face with this stuff. How in the world would you breathe through that stuff? And then how in the world would you get out of that and leave the grave clothes there? And they, I mean, just all sorts of things that just don't make a lot of sense. But this has been proposed, okay? But, but this is, um, um, yeah, th this, I found this in some of uh, Josh McDowell's material. It says, some time ago I read a local advice column that featured a reader's question about the resurrection. The reader asked, Dear Eutychus, our preacher said that Jesus swooned on the cross and then his disciples nursed him to health. What do you think? Signed, Bewildered. Eutychus responded, Dear Bewildered, beat your prison preacher with a cat of nine tails 39 times, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his side, embalm him, and put in this airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but I mean, that's what Jesus went through, right? Um, and so for people to claim this, is, it, it's hard to, to fathom, um, but people do. So, okay. Uh, any questions on that one? Okay. That one's probably one of the easier ones to um, defend because uh, it's really hard to imagine anybody coming back after all that. Okay. Now, the second one is another one that actually is not new. This actually, we find the reference to this in the scriptures themselves is the fact that the body was stolen. 
that the disciples came, stole the body away from the tomb, and then made up the story that Jesus rose from the dead, because Jesus had predicted this, right? So this is another one, okay? But who would steal the body? I mean, if anybody's going to steal, it would be the disciples, right? I mean, why would the Jews steal the body? Jesus is dead. He's in a tomb, a sealed tomb. They don't need to steal him, okay? Would the Romans? They didn't have any reason to steal the body either, okay? The only ones that might might be the disciples. But what was there when Jesus was crucified, what were the disciples doing? They were scattered. They were hiding. Right? They were afraid maybe the same thing was going to happen to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this tomb is being guarded by a Roman guard. Uh, not something they're probably going to be able to overcome. Yes? Now the Jews and the Romans wanted him to stay dead. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, the Jews in particular wanted to make sure that body stayed there. Right? Because they knew Jesus had claimed he was going to come back in three days. And so they didn't want to make sure that body stayed there. And so they, you know, asked Pilate if they could post a guard and wrote, yeah, post a guard. And this guard then would have been probably anywhere from four to ten people guarding it 24-7. Yes, Derek? Is that why they put him in a tomb and not just bury him? Do they want to make sure he can escape if he well, wants to rise in or whatever? Um, perhaps yes and no. It was Joseph Arimathea that donated his own private tomb for Jesus for his burial. Mm -hmm. So he was a disciple of Jesus, so he donated his tomb. And he was a rich man, so he had a good tomb, mm -hmm. right? A, a really nice place uh, to bury. And they donated his that for Jesus to bury. Yes, Jay? Uh So, yeah, and, I mean, also thinking, like, you know, the, the structure of this tomb, like, physically speaking, like, I've seen in illustrations where it's, like, a round, like, concrete yes. stone slab. It's like, how is one or two guys going to get past a guard and, and move that, that big old Jackson, you know? Like, that's yeah, just not going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, here's kind of an artist rendition. I mean... Uh, you've got this posted guard. I mean, they're heavily armed. Um, you know, they've got it sealed. I mean, this is just showing a couple of bands ago. We don't know exactly how they sealed it, per se, but it's sealed. And I was also reading this. The stone was probably about one and a half to two tons. I mean, this is, you know, more than a car weighs, and it's, it's a stone. I mean, and it's also likely when they roll the stone down, they've got it. It's rolled down into that. So you, it's not going to be easy. You've got to roll this thing uphill to move it. Um, so physically, I mean, you know, get all 12 of us in here and try and move it. To, it it'd be tough, right? It'd be tough, and we overcome a guard as well. I mean, it's just, it, it's hard to fathom that they would be able to, to do this. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, some things to think about, you know, who's going to benefit? We've talked about it. The only ones that would really benefit would be the disciples, but then, why would they make up the story and go to death for this, you know, this idea that Jesus raised from the dead, okay? Um, and how are they going to get by the guard? You know, they weren't well equipped, well armed. Uh, the Romans certainly were. Um, so this would be hard to imagine. Um, and again, if it was stolen by unbelievers, I mean, this is something, had they, the unbelievers stolen, they would have produced the body and say, he didn't raise, here's his body, right? But nobody ever did. Um, nobody could ever actually refute, even back then, the fact that the tomb was empty. Um, you know, so you have to look at how do you explain these things, okay? All right. Yeah, and I mean, if they're stealing it, then they've got to make up the story of the resurrection. You know, there's, there's kind of a conspiracy type theory. Um, and this again comes from, this is Eusebius. Eusebe uh, he's a historian that I think we referred to before. Um, he was the first to argue that it was inconceivable that such a well-planned, thought-out conspiracy could succeed. Eusebius satirically imagined how the disciples might have motivated each other to take this route. Let's band together to invent all the miracles and resurrection appearances which we never saw, and let's carry the sham even to death. Why not die for nothing? Why dislike torture and whipping inflicted for no good reason? Let's go out to all the nations and overthrow their institutions, denounce their gods, and even if we don't convince anybody, at least we'll have the satisfaction of drawing down ourselves the punishment for our own deceit. You know, it's, you know, it's kind of satirical, but at the same time, it's kind of like, why would you do that? Why would you invent a lie and go to death for it and try and convince other people of a lie? Um, it, it, it just doesn't seem real plausible. Okay. Um, 
you know, we look at conspiracy, and we got those going around today, too. Um, Chuck Colson, special counsel to President Nixon during the Watergate scandal, um, actually that was in the 70s for the Watergate, uh, knows full well how difficult it is to keep conspiracy together. He said, I know how impossible it is for a group of people, even some of the most powerful in the world, to maintain a lie. Watergate cover-up lasted only a few weeks before the first conspirator broke and turned state's evidence. Um, adds Paulie Little, author of Know What You Believe, uh, men will die for what they believe to be true, though it may actually be false, but they don't, however, die for what they know is a lie. You know, I mean, there's people today that believe certain things that are lies, right? But normally people don't know a lie and intentionally go to death because they know it's a lie. Yeah. And so why would the apostles invent this story, steal the body and invent this story knowing it wasn't true? It just doesn't seem very plausible. All right. Any other questions on that one? Okay. Okay. Another one that's kind of along those lines is the idea they were hallucinating, right? They just saw a figment of their imagination or they believed they saw, right? Um, but when you consider all the different people who are recorded as having seen the Lord, the women at the tomb to begin with, um, if, if they were trying to invent a conspiracy, they wouldn't have probably started with women. Women's testimony really wasn't regarded very highly back then at all. Um, but yet this first one we see recorded. Um, and we see Peter and John, a couple of apostles. We see the 12 apostles, including Doubting Thomas. We talk about Doubting Thomas. You know, we always hear that story. But if you actually look at the accounts, all the disciples actually at one point were doubters until they saw Jesus. They just happened to see him before Thomas did, right? Um, and Thomas kind of needed that same physical appearance, but he, you know, um, but he saw him. We have many other appearances. We don't have exact names and dates and so forth, but he says he appears to many other people. And Paul records over 500 witnesses at one time. And how do you get a massive, a whole bunch of us to see the same hallucination at the same time? That's hard to fathom. Yes, Keith? And also look at the timing of all these. How, how long did this take place? There's yeah. 40 days of right. him showing himself. Right. This is over a period of 40 days yeah. that he's showing himself, right? Okay. Tyler? I can't remember exactly where it's at in Scripture, but doesn't Paul in one of his letters make an allusion uh, to the fact that, like, if, if somebody didn't believe that these things happened, you could just go ask the people around him? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, yeah. I think we read this, that... Um, uh, when he's talking about the gospel account, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and following, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, this is talking about the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And the idea is they're still living. If you want to check this out, you can go find them and talk to them. Go talk to the eyewitnesses, right? Um, and so there were a number of people around that had seen them, okay, still. And Paul wrote this around, around 20 years after Jesus' death. So a lot of them were still around to verify these facts, okay? You said uh, in an earlier class about what they wouldn't, and even in the court of law, they wouldn't use 500. Once they got, you know, half a dozen or 12 or whatever, the eyewitnesses. Yeah, I mean, most of the time you only needed two, say, two yeah. or three eyewitnesses, usually enough to settle a case. Right. Yeah, so if you brought in 500 or were saying the same thing, um, yeah, it'd be considered. Although back then in the Jewish system, women were very rarely were Jewish women allowed to testify. Their testimony was not considered val valid. Um, but we have them uh, recorded here in the scripture. Yeah, I mean, you consider all these different people, and for them to all have the same, you know, hallucinations, um, you know, it's just kind of hard to fathom. Um, oops. Let's see if I get. Oh, yeah. And so, again, we, the other thing, too, do hallucinations eat fish, right? And we have the gospel accounts that Jesus actually came and ate fish with them, right? So, I mean, you wouldn't normally see these kind of things, okay? Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, you know, and how many people see, in the, see the same hallucination at the same time? I mean, we have accounts of the 12 appearing more than once. Thomas, and he appears again, 500 witnesses. You know, same, several people together. 
How many times do you ever see several people seeing the same hallucination at the same time? Possible. I exactly. Mean, like, yeah. Even with like any sort of narcotics or anything that existed back then, like it's almost nearly impossible for everyone to have the same mm -hmm. like trip at the same time. Exactly. And same like headspace. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. It's exactly. nearly impossible. Exactly. And yeah, and to have all these different appearances and people having okay, it, it's not very plausible, right? Okay. All right. And then how many people actually die for the hallucination, right? They've seen something that they've actually died for. They're willing to convince others that what they saw was true. You know, most people start recognizing, oh, that was a hallucination. I would, you know, you know, even they come back from, yeah, that was quite a trip, you know, but, um, but they don't try and say that was real stuff and you ought to believe these things, you know, okay. Um, and how many people believe the stories of those who saw hallucination as well, you know, so. You know, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, see, yeah, we're, we're blessed. We've not seen him, but we believe, yeah. but we believe based on the evidence, right? Tyler? Well, and so I know that we've <clears throat> mentioned this before, but what's so crazy is like, you know, today when you Christians are, you know, um, born again, right? Like people will say, oh, well, they don't really believe it or, oh, it's not true. But you're talking about at a time where you were literally killed for your religion, like almost on the spot. And yet people that weren't eyewitnesses found enough evidence to believe it. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, it is. That it wasn't just the people of that day, but it was also people 100 years later who had never seen Jesus, but they believed enough so they were willing to go to death for it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that brings us to kind of this next one, too, that some people want to claim that, you know, that Christians added these stories later on. You know, they talked about this Jesus and they started adding story and embellishing the stories and making up these miracles and all these things uh, to kind of help further their cause. Um, but, you know, what, you know. How, that though, I mean, you know, the, the, these people that are saying they embellished it, I mean, that's just a, yeah. they just don't want it so well, they're going to make up anything. They well, yeah, they can't. And, and there are, I mean, if you go back and look at like some of the apocryphal writings that came out of the first, second, third century, there are some stories that, were discredited. They're not taken as true. Um, one of the stories, I don't think I've got it in my notes, but one of the stories came out that Jesus was actually an identical twin. And it was an identical twin that showed up after Jesus was crucified, you know. But that was a story that was invented like 200, 100 or 200 years later. So if that had been true, wouldn't they have been able to prove that back then? Yeah. Tyler? Well, they actually have a fragment of the Gospel of John from like 90 AD. Yeah. So how does that work? <laughs> exactly. I mean, we have evidence that these things were written in the first century. And so it wasn't things that were made up later, right? Yes. Well, John said these things were written that you might believe. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and these things were recorded in the first century, and they were recording these kind of things. So to say they were made up later is hard to imagine. There's a lot of different, you know, evidences that, I mean, um, if you look at like, you know, Nero in the 60s, the Christians were already known that he's already persecuting, putting to death for their beliefs because they did not want to bow down to Caesar's Lord. You know, so these things, the Christians were already teaching and believing these things in the first century, right? Polycarp, what do you say? Yeah. Eusebius. Yeah. You know, what? He was 80, what, 86 years old or something yeah. like that? Yeah. And he says, no, yeah. no way. I'm, I'm not going to denounce, renounce Christ. That's right. No way. Yeah, Polycarp was actually a disciple of John, actually yes. knew the apostle John, and then he was put to death for his faith somewhere in the second century, and, and basically said, yeah, that, you know, how can I deny my Lord who's taken care of me all these years? Um, yeah, that people believed these things, that there was evidence for it, for them to believe these things, yeah. And again, looking at historical evidence, um, you know, that people were being persecuted from the start for saying Jesus was raised from the dead. So it wasn't something that was added later. Um, just historical accounts show that, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so those are kind of the primary, you know, theories, the way that people try to explain away the resurrection. So if you don't have those, what are you left with? He, he actually did raise the dead, right? Okay. And, and so we actually look at that. I mean, there's, we can actually find evidence for this you know we're not just trying to discredit other ones we're saying okay is there actual evidence that these things occurred um first of all we've already looked at other explanations are unlikely 
Now, historians, because the, the resurrection is a miracle, right? This is not something that would naturally occur. We don't see people coming back from the dead on their own. Um, so it's a miracle. Historians, they don't like to give credence to a miracle because it's so unlikely. So they always try and come up with something they think is more probable. And that's where some of these other explanations come. Well, it might be more probable that other things occurred. But when you actually look at the evidence for the resurrection, it's like, yeah, it, there's good evidence for it. Okay. So we've looked at some of these other evidences. Um, the various appearances and eyewitnesses attesting to the resurrection, right? Uh, we have those in the gospel accounts. The time frame from the events to the claim is short, not long enough to develop a myth or legend. They were already talking about these things virtually immediately after it happened, right? Um, so it's, they can't really claim it was a myth or a legend. That this was something from the very start. You said the church yeah. uh, did that in, what, 30 years or something, I think? They yeah. Talk about that? Oh, yeah. They made it up after, after 30 years after, you know. Yeah, they say that, but there's, there's, there's evidence. There's stuff before that. There's stuff before that that was already going on. They were used to telling these stories, yes. Now, Peter preached the resurrection 10 days after yeah. the ascension. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... Um, you know, just right from the beginning, this was the this was the heart and soul of the message, right? Okay, and you know, other evidence we see too is the transformation of the disciples' behavior. I mean, we can we talk about doubting Thomas, but I mentioned all the apostles were kind of that way till they actually saw Christ. But we could also look at like James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. If you go back and look in the gospel accounts, you know, Jesus' own family when Jesus was ministering, they didn't believe he was the Christ. It's, Huh. Who? What, we know you grew up with you. You know who are you? You know, yeah, exactly. And they, and so they they were really skeptical that Jesus was a Christ, and yet James, the brother, becomes one of the leaders in the church and writes the book of James. He becomes a, a faithful believer. What changed his mind? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, what changed his mind? It's a good question, right? Because there's evidence that he changed his mind, right? Um, and he, I don't think he would change his mind based on a lie. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then we have, um, you know, the Apostle Paul is another great one. I mean, here's somebody who is literally trying to persecute the church out of existence because of their belief. And suddenly he becomes the biggest spokesman for the beliefs, you know. I mean, it's, it's I mean, if you're trying to get kind of a modern day thing, it'd be like Saddam Hussein coming over and promoting democracy, you know, you know, or Trump going over and promoting, you know, um, communism, you know, I mean, it's that kind of a, a shift in thinking. It just seems unfathomable to us unless something of, you know, magnificent proportion happened. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah. He was told, you know, it's hard to kick against the goat. Yeah, you're persecuting him. And yeah, he has a personal appearance in Christ. Oh, Christ really did come back from the dead. Yes, it's true. And he goes on, like Jesus was doing, he goes on and goes through the Old Testament scriptures to show that that was the case. Okay. Um, so, again, I mean, you don't see these kind of transformation in people's lives unless there's something of substance to it to cause them to make those kind of changes. You know, yeah. Okay. Um, then we see just the emergence of the Christian church from Judaism. Initially, Christianity was just seen as a, a sect, a part of Judaism. But as people began to, you know, listen to them, they realized that they were distinct because of, particularly because they say Christ was, Jesus was the Christ, and he rose from the dead. This is not something the Jews were proclaiming, certainly. And so you see it coming out of Judaism because of these beliefs, right? Believing that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. He was the Christ. He proved to be the Christ, okay? And we see the emergence of Sunday as a day of worship. What day did the Jews worship on? Saturday, the Sabbath, seventh day of the week. We worship on the first day. Why? Because of the resurrection, right? Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Because it's called the day of the Lord in the scriptures, right? It's the day that we come to celebrate, okay? And we worship on. That was okay. always the example of the church. Too. Yeah, I mean, right from the beginning, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, right from the beginning that this was the custom of them. So it's based on that resurrection. Okay. Um, we see the New Testament accounts. They don't resemble later apocryphal accounts. I mentioned the story about Jesus having a twin. There's other stories about Jesus having, you know, uh, uh, getting married and having children. I mean, there's all sorts of different stories 
but none of them really had the, the credence, the historical credence that the gospel accounts did. They're, they're definitely different. None of them were really accepted as being um, legitimate, um, but they're out there. People read them today and say, oh yeah, look at people had all these stories. But when you compare them, there's a difference in quality. Yes. And as, as much of a, an iconic person that Jesus Christ is, like outside of our faith, like even with like historians and non-believers, you know, Christ still exists heavily in history, right? Oh yeah. So if, you know, if people are saying, you know, that his body was stolen or any of this stuff, it's like, okay, well, if he's this big of an iconic person outside of our faith, don't you think they would have found him by now? Yep. Yeah. Like, like with the forensic uh, science that we have nowadays, like we can test all those bones and whatnot, and we would have found him by now. Like every, every, you know, hand on deck would be looking for him. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's probably organizations out there still looking for him. Oh yeah. To just yeah. To prove us wrong. Right. Yeah. We, we looked early in the last several months ago, if you remember, we talked about archeology span and how archeology span continues to confirm what the Bible has written. I mean, over and over the things they find Oh yeah, Bible was right when it said this. Yeah, um, so yeah, exactly. Because uh, people wanted to deny what the Bible said because we don't have any evidence of it. And then the archaeology keeps turning up. Oh yeah, it's true. And and certainly back in the day, I mean, had Jesus' body still been around, the Jews for sure would have wanted to produce that body and show that he's still dead. But they never could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. um we don't have a tomb that was venerated as a burial place, the body of Jesus. I mean, a lot of people, you know, iconic places, people go back to, you know, kind of back to that tomb, but we don't have that today. We don't, you know, we don't know exactly where Jesus was buried. We don't. They did in his day. It was a tomb that was, would have been known. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, a crucified Messiah would have been viewed by Jewish Christians cursed by God. I mean, this was, this was an anathema to them. It just didn't seem possible that God would do this. Um, so it's, I mean, the Christ, Christian faith grew out of Judaism, but it was very distinct, okay? Um, and for them to rely on this would have been, you know, just very distinct from the Jew, Jewish faith, um, okay? And again, the naturalistic explanation of empty tune doesn't hold up the evidence. So we have many of, I mean, just the history itself of what's occurred, as Jacob pointed out as well, that the, how many people believe in Jesus today, you know, if, if none of this was true, why would people still be believing this? Why would we be teaching it? The evidence is there. Um, but, you know, people like, it, and we shouldn't be too surprised. Because if you think about when Jesus was alive and doing all his miracles, even some of the people who witnessed some of these things still denied it, right? Yeah, some of the, you know, the Pharisees, they denied it and they wanted to cover it up. And they certainly didn't want the resurrection to be true because then it would really, you know, it would be proof that Jesus would claim to be. They were scared to death. Yeah, they were and their power and everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Um, and I don't have in here, I mean, all the people who died for their belief. I mean, not just the apostles, but people in the first, second, third century were dying for their belief. You know, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs, I and mean, it actually goes through even more than the third century about people who died for their faith. They were not willing to deny that these things are true. Um, I mean, these are all lines of evidence um, we can look at. And we have I mean, other people, and we kind of look at outside how people have viewed these things. Uh, Simon Greenleaf, he was a professor of law at Harvard in the 1800s, considered probably one of the best legal minds when he came to evidence uh, within the courtroom. He's got a three-volume work called A Treatise, uh, Treatise on the Law of Evidence, has been considered by the Supreme Court to be the greatest single authority on legal evidence. So here's somebody that understands how evidence works in a legal system. And he writes... He said, if the evidence for the resurrection was set before any unbiased courtroom in the world, it would be judged to be an historical fact. Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, if you consider all the evidence and you look at it from you know, just a legal standpoint, I'd, he'd consider it a fact. Okay? Um, here's another attorney. Nothing in law so convinces courts and juries of the truthfulness of a story as the fact that a man's life has been consistent with such a story. And again, you go back to the disciples and the apostles, they consistently told the same story and were willing to die for that. And that 
you know, from an attorney standpoint, and you know, jury standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. So, okay. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, concluding all this, then we find Jesus is who he claimed to be. He claimed to be the Son of God in the flesh, and it's proven by rising from the dead. Let's turn to Romans, chapter one. So we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. So it's the first of the epistles, a letter from Paul to the Romans. And look at the way he opens this letter to the Romans. Now this, this letter is written probably around, if I remember correctly, around no, the late 50s, 57 AD or so. So probably about 25 years after Jesus' resurrection. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, I'm reading from the NIV version, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, Paul is affirming here, yes, he's a descendant of David, but he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection of the dead. In the flesh. In the flesh, yeah. Yeah, um, so this is, I mean, this is the conclusion, you know, of him being raised from the dead, resurrected, is that he is, in fact, the Son of God, like he claimed to be, okay? All right. Um, it demonstrates that he can overcome death. Uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians, which is the book right after Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, much of Roman, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 deals with the resurrection. We may spend a few moments there in a couple passages here in a moment. But if we look at verses 54 through 57 in that text, it's right near the end of that chapter, uh, Paul here writes, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, because Jesus rose from the dead, we can overcome death, right? Um, yeah, without that, we don't have any hope. Uh, we looked at that, okay? All right. So just a couple, you know, things, kind of final discussion here, and I got a couple wrap-up scriptures as well. What do you consider to be the strongest evidence for his resurrection? Okay. Uh, for me, the strongest evidence for Jesus' resurrection is the, and the, the way I always thought about it is the way the disciples acted after he died. Yeah. You could, or excuse me, after he died and he rose. You know, you okay. see the difference, right? He died, they're separated, they're scattered, their hearts are broken, and they act yeah. like they're so dejected, and they're, they're, they go back to their old life. Yeah. And then after he, rose, he raises and he, you know, he appears to them. You see the change. It's like that, right? Yeah. They turn around, and all of a sudden, they, they live the rest of their life for God, right? And they die for Him. Yeah. And they, you know, yeah. they live a they live a pretty rough life. Actually, yeah, they actually do. Yeah. yeah. We we talked about Paul. We talked about Thomas. We didn't talk about the other apostles. But that's true. I mean, they all, you know, were basically in hiding and scared, and they come out very forceful for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and willing to go to death for it. Not an easy life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's very. That's, they were convinced that it was They true. were absolutely convinced. So, and if anybody was going to be convinced, it means, yeah, okay. Good, okay. All right, somebody else, Paul, you were going to say something? Well, I was going to say the 500 that you appeared to, you know, at, at that time. I mean, that has to be a, one of the big ones, too, for evidence okay. and so forth. But there, there, are, there are others, too. Uh, you know, what, I, think, I think of Thomas, because that, that, that's... You know, yeah. He said, ah, I don't believe that. Yeah. You know, I, I got to see it all, you know. Yeah. But when he saw it, he, he melted. Yeah. My Lord and my God, you know. Yeah. Well, when you, re when you go through and read the accounts of the resurrection, the women see him first, or they report yes. that he's alive. They come back and tell the apostles. They don't believe it. And, and Jesus tells them, he says, go, or the angel told the um, women, go tell the apostles, I'm going to go meet you in Galilee. But Jesus ends up meeting him in Jerusalem first because they doubt it, right? You know, they, what? No, can't be, right? Until Jesus appeared. Yes, I'm here. We're going to meet in Galilee, right? Yeah, yeah so, but, and it has to do the same with Thomas, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. How about weak evidence? Or is, is any of it very weak? Any weak evidence. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it all kind of adds up. I mean, all the different evidence you can look at all adds up. Okay. All right. 
there's hearsay, you know, people, you know, the yeah. Pharisees, the Jews, all that. No, no, he, you know, somebody's going from the grave, blah, blah, right. blah. Right. Well, yeah. You know, and, it's, and that's what was recorded in the book of Matthew. Um, in Matthew's account, he records the fact that the, um, the guards, let's yeah. see, in, in Matthew chapter 28, yeah. the very last chapter there in verse 11 and following, while the women were on their way, this is going to tell the apostles what happened, some of the guards went to the city, reported to the chief priest everything that happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you're to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews this very day. You know, so they were, you know... They must have had a little bit of power with They had a little bit of power. Oh, yeah, there. they did. They, don't mess they had with some your pull. guys here because we don't want that to get around. Yeah, exactly. They, they had some political pull with uh, Pilate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, bribery seemed to, to be able to be worked for them. Yeah, to some degree. Yes. At the time Jerusalem was captured in 70 AD, uh, the Jewish leaders and all, they had amassed a treasure of 138 tons of gold and silver. Oh. Hmm. So they had enough to take care of the soldiers and the government. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, and so they came up with that story uh, that was circulated, but it couldn't hold water against the other evidence and stuff. Derek? So, like, if you, I don't know, the way I think about it, I'm trying to think how uh, someone that's not a Christian would think, mm -hmm. and they, yes. I think they would say something like, uh, the evidence that we have is based on a book written by other men that we don't know to be true, so what other evidence would we have? Yeah, and I think what we have is we have the evidence of history itself, of Christianity developing as it has. And without the resurrection, Christianity would go away. Yeah. Um, Heather? Yeah. Well, you have like a handful, if not more, people that wrote about events that occurred in the Bible. Like you have multiple people Same. that wrote about the darkness that came when Jesus um, was crucified, like the eclipse. Because the way that it happened, from what I understand, is that an eclipse wasn't even really possible in the first place at that point in time, and it wouldn't have lasted for yeah, that amount of time. Yeah. Um, one of the things, too, that I think is really cool to do with people that are doubting is uh, just start from the beginning, because really, like, going all the way back to Genesis, right, like, you have the blessing of, uh, of uh, Jacob's sons, like, they... Like he blessed Judah and he said the scepter won't, you know, pass from you. And then you have things like my personal favorite in Psalm 22, where he says, all the ends of the world shall turn to the Lord and all the families of all nations will worship you. And so he's saying like a huge, a hugely bold claim at that time saying that, yeah, this is going to spread to the entire world. Like nobody would have thought that back then unless it was inspired of God. Yeah. So... Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things I didn't really cover in this is that uh, one of the things that people claim is the Christians in the first century, they went back to the Old Testament to try and prove Jesus. But the Jews, and, and they're right, the Jews didn't really believe that. So the Christians just kind of made up from the Old Testament these, oh, they, they, this fits, this fits. But it had been there. I mean, if this is God's word, he knew what he was talking about. It all fits together, right? Um, and I think early on we had looked, I think I passed out that sheet. We just read some Old Testament scriptures and says, that's what happened to Jesus, right? Um, it's been there, right? Uh, the Jews didn't fully understand it, but that's what Jesus went back and was showing the, on the road to Emmaus. That's what the apostle Paul did. And that's, that's really one of the things, even the apostle Peter, that helped convince them. They went back to the Old Testament scriptures they knew and showing this Jesus fits this, right? He fulfilled these things. Um, and it grew out of that. And so to me, that's one of the evidences, even if you don't have a whole lot of other historians outside of the Bible, just the fact that Jews would be convinced based on the evidence of the day they could refute, they believed. You know. um, and, and other you know, historians have shown, yeah, these people did believe these things, they followed these things, people went to death for them. So, so the Bible yeah. is a historical book. It is. It, no doubt. Yeah. Now, what, what would we think if uh, did, did uh, did Napoleon get uh, ripped up in Waterloo? <laughs> what was that, yeah. that British general? Well, yeah, I mean, people believe that Caesar <laughs> ruled Rome. But yeah. we, we have more 
copies and evidence of the Bible than we do for Caesar or for any of the other Greek people, Roman people that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have more, more copies and evidence of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There's more evidence about Christ. Yeah. There is Mark Yeah. 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 We looked at that. I think several months ago we looked at some of that. Chris, you had something. Uh, several years ago, I saw a thing that was put out by some mathematician somewhere uh, concerning uh, the odds of someone meeting two or three of the prophecies of Christ. And I mean, it, there's so many zeros after things that's unreal. But to match the number that's recorded of all the prophecies fulfilled, which is fulfilling all of them. This is astronomical. Yeah. Yeah, it really is to fit all those things. I mean, you know, some people would say, well, Jesus was a really smart man. He knew what all these things were, and he just made sure his life fit all those things. And yet some of the things that were written and prophesied when they were written didn't exist. Things about the crucifixion. It's like, and the Jews didn't crucify people. So why would the Jews have written about, you know, his hands and feet being pierced and stuff? And, or, you know, it's like, how does this stuff happen? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Middle it was someplace in the Middle East. I don't remember, but it was definitely prior to the Romans. Islam. They kind of perfected it. Yeah. So. Yeah. But plus, there's plenty of prophecies about Jesus. He had no control over. Him. Yeah. He was born. Right. He didn't, have, was. That, he didn't have control over those right. things. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. No. Yeah. It was a lot about Jesus. That yeah. You just you just couldn't make this stuff up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was actually reading about the crucifixion too. We have the word excruciating, which actually means out of the cross. That, that that word comes from that because it was such such a pain. They didn't have a word for the amount of pain that you know people on the cross would suffer. And so the word excruciating basically comes from that out of the cross. And we think about excruciating pain, we think about the worst pain you can possibly imagine. Yeah. So um, yeah. So there's lots of I mean there's a lot of evidence there. Okay. All right. A couple minutes left, and we might tackle some of this next week as well. Um, the implications for us today. What does this mean for us today, right? Um, the divini divinity of Jesus rests on the resurrection of Jesus. We just read that passage in Romans. Saying he was declared with power to be the Son of God because he rose from the dead. It's proving that he's the Son of God. He didn't just claim it when he was here on earth and do all those miracles, which by themselves were proving it, but the fact that he rose from the dead uh, really cemented that fact. He is the Son of God, okay? Okay. Um, See, I think I'll come to the rest of them next week. What I want to ask, I just want to ask one quick question. What's the difference between resurrection and being raised from the dead? Because we know there were people that in the Bible records other people raised from the dead. But what's the difference? Uh, one is permanent, one's not. Okay. Yeah, the resurrection was permanent. Is that what you are going to say, Trent or Keith? I was going to add something else okay. to too. I mean, the resurrection, the, Jesus rose people from the dead, whereas resurrection was he didn't have, I mean, it was the power in himself that did it, Okay. right? You know, it wasn't necessarily something, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the other people we see were raised to the dead. I mean, they came back to life basically because of somebody else. Christ had the power to take up life again on his own, okay? But he came back never to die again. Keith, are you going to say that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Paul says that he's still a man, Christ Jesus. Yeah. Our Lord. Yeah, he he's still, time. yeah, he, he's alive forever. Um, whereas the other people who came back from the dead, we don't, they're not here, right? They died again, right? Lazarus, um, the other people in the Old Testament, New Testament, yeah. So there's definitely a difference. The resurrection, this was a permanent, and this is something, we'll, we'll pick up this next week because I want to look at that in terms of our implications for us today in the resurrection, okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done, okay? Heavenly Father, we're again mindful of the awesomeness of your power that is able to do all these things. You predicted that Jesus would come and live die for our sins, and we'd raise again on the third day, which he did. We're grateful for what you have done for us, showing your, demonstrating your love for us and overcoming these things in our lives, the sin. And we pray, Father, you'd help us to um, overcome the temptation that so often engulfs us, that we might live for you and bring you honor and glory, that we can spend eternity with you, and we look forward to that day. May we always honor you and your word and your name and all that we do. Through Jesus we pray. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, this, um, I have some copies of a lot of those things we just went through. I've got copies. Um, a lot of this comes from uh, Josh McDowell. And so if you want some of the background information, other stuff, I've got some copies. You're welcome to have one of those. Yeah. So, yeah.
Yep, thank you.